All right, so, um, oh, we're supposed to talk about constants as well. So variables and constants. So when we look at the, the physical hardware of the computer, there is one place that I can store a, ver store a value and you know, let it sit around for a little while and then bring it back. What is the name of that place? R RAM, yeah, random access memory. Now, there's other places that we can store values. Like we've got the hard disk in there, and we can, you know, the nice thing about the hard disk is if we lose power, the data stays there on the hard disk, that's okay. Um, but before we can actually use that information on the hard disk, we've got to read it into RAM. It's got to go into RAM before we can really use it. And so um, your computer's got a whole lot of RAM. Do you know, good lady on the first row, how much computer or how much memory is in your nice Lenovo orange-ish computer? <laughs> do, do you know? Used to know, you know, when you bought it, maybe. So how, who, how many know, who, who knows what you got? In the back, how much you got? 16, 16 gigabytes of RAM. Is that a lot or a little? That's a lot. How much is it? Let me give you an idea for how much memory that is. The full text of the Book of Mormon fits on about 1.2 megabytes. Um, so... So we have 16,000 times that much memory. So you could take, in fact, with a little compression, you can get it under a megabyte. So you could take the full text of the Book of Mormon, and you could put it in memory on your computer 16,000 times. So let's suppose that we've got, I'm going to suppose it's only 12,000 times. And let's suppose the Book of Mormon is an inch thick. Let's stack up. We'd have 12,000. We would have a 1,000-foot tall stack of copies of the Book of Mormon. How tall is the Tanner Building? Yeah, you know, less than 100. We got 12, what do we say? 12, what do we say, 1,000? 10 times as tall as the Tanner. That's how tall that stack of copies of the Book of Mormon would be that you could fit into memory. 10 times as tall as the Tanner building. Um, if we were to kind of think of that, it would probably fill this room up about halfway. That's, that's, a lot of that's how much memory you've got just sitting in there. Is that a lot? That's a lot. So what we're talking about is how are we going to find just a little tiny bit that we need to be able to store somebody's name. And we're going to ask someone, enter your name. They'll enter their name. We'll do some processing, and later off, we're going to you know, we'll print out a piece of paper that says, you know, here's your report, and it has their name on it. We've got to remember that between when they typed it in and when we print it out. How are we going to do that? And the answer is we're going to put it in memory. Whew. In fact, this is what it looks like right there. There's, chi there's memory chip. So we've got to do something that actually tells, right? You know, if we could open this up with a microscope and look in there, we'd say right there is where we're going to put this value, and we've got to be able to call it back. Now, in the early days of working with memory, we actually referred to these locations by their address. Each, each one of those 16 billion bytes, actually, each one of those 16 billion bytes has eight little smaller parts in it. And each one of those little bits, so you got, so what's 16 times eight? That's the same as 32 times four, that's 64. 120, you got 128 billion little values that you can turn on and off inside that computer. And every single one of those has an address where we can say, you know what, we want to go to that. We're talking about that specific one. We use these kind of long numbers to refer to, to each little location in memory. Every location's got its own address for where we can refer to it. And it used to be in the early days of working with memory that we referred to them by their physical location. You know, we would look right into that one of those chips and we would say, right there, I'm going to store a value. And then right over here, we're going to store a value. Of course, they weren't chips at the time. They were they kind of, well, we won't think about it, but they were big. You could actually look at them and say, oh, that's the part I'm talking about. <sighs> and that was okay, because our, 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 our computers in those days ran how many programs at once? Just one. Not even, an op not even an operating system, just a program. And so that was fine. But what's the problem as soon as we have two, if we were still accessing memory by physical address, if we've got two programs running simultaneously? Any thoughts? What's the problem? I, as a programmer, I said, I want that one part of memory, right? That's what I want. And what happens if another programmer says, do you see the problem? What's the problem? It's coming up. Yeah, the other programmer says, I want that spot of memory right there. Then I would write the value into memory. The other program is running. It writes a different value into memory. And I go read my value out. What do I got? I don't know. Whatever he put in there. Uh, it could be anything. That's a problem. In fact, you're too young to remember this. In the 1990s, when Windows was really just starting to become popular, <coughs> 
Microsoft still trying to understand how to you know, organize all this stuff. And it was possible, that time it was possible for a program to go access memory directly. And if that program read memory that hadn't been given to it by the operating system, Windows would just go, you're done. And it would just terminate the program, right? Are any of, any of you nodding? This has happened. It's called a general protection fault. And just says, your program tried to do something that's not allowed. It tried to access memory that I didn't give to it. It's the, op it's the job of the operating system to say, oh, you want some memory? I'll allocate this memory to you. Program tries to, op to access something that wasn't allocated to it. It would just turn it off. I'm not sure why we don't see those problems anymore. It would still probably do something similar if it ever happened, but maybe we just don't, it doesn't happen anymore. It was always really frustrating because you're working around in Excel, and then all of a sudden, boom, you get a dialog box that said GPF, general protection fault, and there's no recovery. You know, restart Excel, that was it. And so being able to manage memory across multiple programs happening at the time, that's what the operating system does. And so now when we're saying, hey, I got to store a value somewhere here in memory, do I care the physical address? I couldn't care less where it is. Just give me some memory. And so I write the program. I tell the VBA interpreter by writing VBA code, I say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a variable. And that's what a variable is. In fact, I think our next screen says what a variable is. Yeah. A variable is a location in memory. It's got a name. So that's, that's the key right there. It is a named location in memory. Now, where does the name exist? Na the name only exists in my program. My, my interpreter is going to keep track of the name and the address, but that's, that's what it is. Where a value of a particular data type, we'll talk about data types today, can be stored and retrieved. That's the idea. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, I've got to store somebody's name. Well, you know, name. I'm going to do a certain syntax, which we'll see today. I've got to say, Give me some memory so I can store a name. The interpreter is going to say, great, you need a name, and I'll give it a name. We'll call it, hmm, the variable has a name, and it's storing the name. It's probably not the best little word confusion there. So instead, let's store a salary. So I've got a, I'm going to store someone's salary. And the interpreter says, great, what name do you want to give this variable? Because the variable has to have a name. And I say, I'm going to call it salary. It's not very creative. I'm going to call it salary. The interpreter says, great, you need some memory. It's going to say, how much memory do you want? And we'll see how you tell how much you want. But I'll say, I, you know, I, I don't need a whole lot. A couple of bytes. It says, fantastic. And it will then say to the operating system, operating system, I need two bytes of memory. The operating system looks across its vast array of memory. And it says, I've got two bytes available right here. And it will send back the address of the first bit in those two bytes. A, a bit. So a byte has eight bits. Eight ones and zeros. What makes up a byte? We think about it in terms of bytes, but it's actually bits at the low level. And so we get the address of the first, the first bit in that series. And the interpreter then gets back that address, and it's some long number, it's some hideously long number that you don't have to think about. That's OK. It remembers the address th that's been given to it, and it binds that to the name that you gave it. The name was salary. So we think salary, and we say, well, I want to change the value in salary. We'll see how to do it. I want to change the value in salary. And the interpreter goes, oh, yeah. There's memory allocated to us. It's at this location. You gave me a value here. I'm going to write it out into memory at that location. And so we don't have to think about it in terms of actually what's happening in the memory. We don't even have to think about it uh, where the memory is or anything. We just think about it by its name. So a variable is a name. Most books that talk about this, they use some kind of analogy where they say, think of it as like a box that has the name written on it. You can put stuff into the box and take it out. That gets you going, but if you're kind of working on some of the more advanced stuff we do in this class, and what you s and you still have this metaphorical understanding of what a variable is, b behavior will happen that will utterly puzzle you. But if we take a little bit of time today to go through and understand really what's going on, you're going to have a you'll have a better foundation for this. Um, this is a really unusual day. Almost every other day from this, we are going to be working in VBA the whole time. You'll be kind of working along with me. Today, let's kind of sit back and watch. And, and it's, it's, you know, don't base whether you're going to add or drop the class today based on this. Because they're all going to be like this. I don't want to take it. I, don't know, I, think, I think it'll still be somewhat interesting, but it'll definitely be much more hands-on than, than we have today. Question? Okay, so the, quest the question is, um, just kind of talking about memory, you can buy some programs that will kind of clean up your memory. And what's going on there? Well, there's kind of two, two categories of programs that do that. There's one that says, we're going to organize your storage, like on your hard disk. 
And so it's possible for your disk to get fragmented briefly. Let me just talk about that. You write a file out onto the disk. And then what happens? Well, there's more storage after that. Some other file gets written after that. And what happens if you increase the size of that file? You can't write it over the one that's next to it because there's data there. And so it has to go, well, from here, you got to go somewhere else. And so you might have a file that is in lots of different places on the hard disk. And so if you, this is one of the reasons that spinning platter media is so much slower than solid state media um, is because you've got to say, oh, I have started reading that file. Took me a while to find where that file started. I can start reading it while it's spinning around, and then, oh wait, I gotta jump over here, so I gotta wait till I find it again, and then read that, oh, I gotta go over here, and so that, your disk becomes fragmented, and so you can defragment the disk, and that's one of the things you might be talking about. But the other one is, is that it's, and you may have noticed this, that you've got your computer, you've been running it for four or five days, it just seems a little bit slower, and you think, I'm gonna turn the whole thing off and start it back up again, and things are running better. Um, because what can happen is that you can have what's called a memory leak in your program. Now, it'd be kind of tough. I'm going to think if I could even, if I was trying to, could I make a memory leak in VBA? I probably could. So here's what happens. If you say, program, I'm going to allocate some memory to this, um, you know, for this program. And then when your program is done using it, it never frees that memory up. It never says, hey, I'm done with this and gives it back to the operating system. In fact, it's possible to even get, you know, memory that stays allocated after your program has closed. So your program's run, but it's still taking, even it's, it's closed, it's still taking up memory because it allocated memory and then didn't clear it up. I'm not sure that's still possible. Windows might, might see that that's the case and, and go clean up after it, even though the program didn't clean up after it. So this is called a memory leak. It's not like your memory's really leaking. It just means it's allocated, but now it's, there's no longer a way for you to use that memory. Um, so why does it slow your computer down if you've got you know, extra things in memory? Do you know the answer to this? It's kind of a fascinating thing. Um, We'll take a minute on this, too, because you asked the question, and then we'll move on. So, and, and, and it actually also gets to the question that's probably going to come up today, which is, why do I care about how much memory I'm using? I've got, you know, 16 billion times 8 of these. You know, I've got a lot to work with. Uh, and the answer is this, is that memory is fast. In terms of how fast can I, can I, can I read that value, it's, it's really fast. Compared to reading data from a hard disk, which is quite a bit slower, it's usually an order of magnitude, at least 10 times um, ten, ten, 10 times longer to access memory from a disk than it is to access it from memory, from RAM. And so um, here's what happens. Let's suppose you don't have 16 gigabytes of memory. You can, you, can, you can end up here with 16 gigabytes of memory, but in most of the things you're doing, it won't happen. Let's suppose you only got 4 gigabytes of RAM. You can fill up 4 gigabytes of RAM pretty easily. You know, you're listening to music, and you are you know got some doing some video editing, you got Excel open, whatever, you, you're just, you know what? You've used all your four gigabytes. Everything's loaded up in memory, and you try to open something else, and it says, and, there, and there's not enough room for it, what's gonna happen? Yeah, well, yeah, it, yeah, it's really slow, but why? That's the question. Does, does Windows say, sorry, you've only got four gigabytes of RAM. You're gonna have to buy some more RAM. Maybe if, if uh, Windows was a hardware company, hey, you need to buy more RAM, maybe that's what they would do, but they don't, they're a software company. You know what happens? And this is why it gets slow, but why is it slow? Here's what happens. The, um, the operating system looks across all the memory, and it goes, oh, look down here in this corner. There's some stuff that we haven't used lately. We haven't used this in like an hour. Uh, but they don't need that anymore. And takes that and copies it to the hard disk. Actually writes that part of memory out to the disk. Is that a slow process? That's a slow process, not as slow if you've got solid state drive, but it's slower. And then it says, look at this, we've got all this memory. You want to open up something else? Great, we can put it right here. That's not so bad. But now what happens when someone asks for that memory that used to be there? Oh, the, <laughs> the, the operating system actually says, oh crap. And it goes, I, I, I put that somewhere else. And it, it goes and gets that information and, it, and it's got to put it back in memory, but what's the problem? There's no room. And so before it can do that, it says, oh, what else have we, we haven't used this. And it'll take that, and it'll put it down to the disk. It'll take this part from the disk, and it'll put it in RAM, and go, ah, oh, there it is. There's your memory. That takes a long time. That's a process called paging. Once your computer starts paging because you've got so much memory, that's when it starts going, oh, it's slow because to do anything, it goes, oh, wait a minute, I can't just read that data out of memory. I've got to go get it from the hard disk, put it back into memory, and then and put it back. That's why, have that, that is the reason that having more memory makes your computer faster. It doesn't make your computer faster until you reach that point where you would have filled up your memory 
But now because you have more, you don't have to start paging. You can just access that memory directly. That is the reason that that happens. And so you're talking about having billions of these things to work with, and we're talking about allocating one, two, three, or four, or maybe at most eight at a time. Um, and so you might think that's not a big deal. But wh what's going to happen is that later here in the course, I'm going to show you how to allocate not just one variable at a time, but a thousand, ten thousand variables with one statement. And then all of a sudden, the number of bytes each variable is taking is going to be important. Okay, go ahead, question. I just want to see if I understood correctly. So if I'm using um, pages of RAM, what's, will it matter if I have four gigs or is gigs? So, it, was, so it's a good question. So let's suppose that in, in my normal use of the computer, all that I ever do is, is get up to using three gigabytes of RAM. That's a really unusual use case, but that's, that's fine. Then will my computer be faster if I've got 16 gigabytes and if I only have four? And the answer is no. It'll be exactly the same. As long as the memory's the same speed, it'll be exactly the same because the reason that memory makes your com more memory makes your computer faster is that it prevents you from having to go through this paging process where you're writing blocks of memory out to disk and bringing them back in. Yeah, you, 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 we, we fill up four gigs routinely today. Yeah, so your, your computer goes into this mode of, of paging. Looking at the age of the computer, it probably has spinning platter media, which is going to be quite a bit slower than solid state. So if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, how could I speed this up, I think you can probably upgrade that disk to a solid state drive, and, and that would not just affect how fast you get data, you know, read data in, like that you're reading from the disk, but once you start paging, you'll page, it'll page a lot faster on a solid state drive. Ah, congratulations, put it in. Don't, don't delay. Okay, other questions? Who knew we'd be talking about such practical things today besides just variables? Okay, so um, that's what we're dealing with. So now the question is, if, if we look at this, everything has to be in, in, in computers, everything. N numbers, letters, music, videos, everything has to be coded down to a series of ones and zeros. That's all we can store in memory is on and off, one and zero. And so the question is, how do we store, let's start, well, how do we store these different things? So let's start with numbers. So here we have one byte. It's eight bits of memory. Here's what we do. We say each one of those bits has a value. This is the ones bit. And this is, this is binary notation. You're just thinking in, in ones, tens, hundreds, thousands column. This is the ones, this is the twos, the fours, the eights, the sixteens. And so when I'm saying I've got zero of all of those, that number is zero. If I, have, oh, if I have just one one, that's one. You might think hey, that's pretty easy. That's the end of it being easy. Zero and one are the same for us. Um, two looks like this, right? It says I've got one two. How many, zero, how many ones do I have? Zero, so that's two. In fact, there's the, there's the uh, there was a t-shirt I saw once that said there are ten kinds of people in the world. Those who understand binary notation and those who don't, right? Because in binary, that is, that's two. So I didn't really say 10. It looks like 10. To the untrained eye, it looks like 10. But it really says two. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who understand that one zero means two, and those that don't. Um, here's three. How long is this going to take us if we go through them all? There's four. You see it? I got one four. I got, what's this? That's yeah, 65. I got a 64. And I got a one. That's 65. Okay, for those of you who are feeling a little bit queasy at this point, at no point am I going to ask you on a test or anything to look at something like this and tell me what it means, okay? So th this, is, this is just, you know, kind of understand this and absorb it, and if you don't totally grasp the whole details of it, that's okay. Just have a general notion of what's going on um, behind the scenes here. Um, I'll, I'll, I will cue you to the points that I'm going to want you to, to understand. So that's 65. How about this? What's this? Wow, who said that? You had to add up 128, 64, 32, 68, and you did that so fast. How, how'd you do it so fast? <laughs> oh, what if you didn't know it? How could you do it? You could do it faster than adding all those things up. How, how could you do it? Wait, let's go back. Let's go back to three. So there's three. I've got both of these are filled up as much as they can go. That is one less than the next column's value. If this one was filled up, it would be 4 plus 2 plus 1, which would be 7, which is 1 less than the next column's value. What's the next column in the series? 256, and so all the ones before it are 1 less than the next column's value. Yeah, so even if you didn't memorize it, you could have you got there pretty quickly if you just you know, realized that one little thing. And so 
uh, yeah, so there's 255. What if I want to do something more than 255? Oh, go home. Give up and go home. That's it. 255 is as big as I can go. 255 is as big as I can go with one byte. Now, if I want to go bigger, I need at least one more bit. But in VBA, we never allocate memory in chunks of less than a byte. And so you don't think about bit level. You think about the byte level. So it takes another byte. And so in another byte now, I've got the same thing I had here, 1 through 128. But now here's my 256. That's how I do 256. If I want to do 512, you know, that would be it. What if I wanted to do 511? What would it look like? Yeah, it would, be, it would be the 1 of 256 and everything else below it, and that would give me 1 less than 512. Very good. How about this one? Aha, there's some zeros in there. Not so easy. Let's see. Oh, easy. 1,000. Why? Because I just gave this presentation a half hour ago. So that's, that's what 1,000 looks like. And if you add 512, 256, 120, you had all those ones up in their place value, that's going to give you 1,000. All right. So now here's the first part that I'm expecting you to now remember. Um, and if you don't remember it today, you, you're some, somehow you're going to learn this before the midterm. And that is we have a data type. So remember, when we create a variable, we're telling VBA, go get some memory for us. We're going to give it a name. We'll call it salary. Hopefully it's not salary with this variable because what's it limited to? 255 is because I can go. Well, maybe if that's... If those are thousands, if the units we think are a thousand, maybe that's okay. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it, hey, it's, I'm going to give it a name. We'll see how to do it. I'll give it a name, and then I've got to tell it I want one byte of memory. How do I tell it I want one byte? Is I tell it the data type. And the data type here is actually called byte. It's the, it's, the, it's the only one where the name is exactly how much memory it is as well. And I'm limited to, so, so, so there's some limits here. What are the limits? 0 to 255. How come 255? I've got 8 bits. I put in 1 in every one of those bits. What am I going to do? Put a 2 somewhere in there? You can't. It's a 1 or a 0. You know, and there's only 8 slots. What happens if I try to cram another 1 in there somewhere between the other slots? You can't do that. In fact, what would, what would happen? If you had something that was completely full in the real world, if you had something that was completely full, and you crammed something else in there. You had a cup that was full, and you put something else in, what would happen? It would either break the cup. I never heard that answer before. That's a good answer. Probably because they used the word cram. Or it would, it would overflow. Yeah, and that's actually the name of the error that happens if you try to put a value into a variable that's too large for it to fit. You'll get a, you'll get a message back that says overflow. That is the one and only error message that will make sense to you during this term. You know, now, when you see that one, you know, ah, overflow. I know what that is. I try to put something that wouldn't fit into memory. Okay, so if I want to do something, you know, larger, I can have two bytes. What it looks like, there's a data type here called integer. Okay, so I'm going to expect you to know the range for byte. What's the range for byte? 0 to 255. Uh, integer has a range, too. Now, integer, the range for integer is a little more complicated than the range for byte. It brings this question. How does VBA represent a negative value? Any thoughts? How are we going to represent a negative value? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So you're talking about something called the sign bit. It's a little bit different in VBA. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get to that. It was great. We have, I know some of you are accountants here, but there must have been an accountant in the last class because said, how are we going to do, you know, how are we going to do negative numbers? And he goes, easy, parentheses. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, there's only zeros and ones here. And I'm thinking, well, maybe a half a zero. That's kind of like parentheses. You cut a zero in half and then move it around, maybe. Um, so here's what we do it, is that we say, all right, we, we're going to store some number, just like we've seen with storing integers. We're going to store some number in there. But instead of just saying that number is the number, we're going to say that number that you stored, we're going to add that to some negative number to start with. So when I, when I say to, the, to, to VBA, I need an integer. Integer can go positive and negative. I need an integer, and I say, I want to store negative 10 in this integer variable. It says, great, I'm going to store some numbers in there because we're going to start counting somewhere way negative so that what, what value am I going to store? So that whatever 
I'm, when I start counting at this really low number, it will get us up to negative 10. And then when you ask for that value back, I'll just give you negative 10. We don't have to think about how it's actually stored in memory. We give it the negative 10, it gives us back the negative 10 when we ask for it. So that negative number happens to be, okay, so here's the 1,000. Here's 1,000 now stored in an integer variable. If we could look into memory and see how that, that 1,000 was stored, that's what it would look like. But because we know this is an integer, when we pull this information out, this is what happens. The interpreter says, I'm going to take the starting point for integers, which is negative 32,768. And I'm going to add on whatever was stored here in the, in the data. And then I'm going to get the actual value. So this value, even though it looks like 1,000 to us human eyes, it's actually negative 31,768. So we just, in, instead of counting at zero, starting at zero, we start way down here in the negative range. So as we build up, we can get up to zero and then go positive. So we've got this whole range now from negative 32,000, you know, up and above that. So this, is, this number is one less than 32,768. So what is this number? That's what's stored there. What is this number actually, what is it? Yeah, that's negative one. We start way down there, we add that number onto it, negative one. Zero, of course, is all zeros, so what's that? Oh, I'm sorry, zero is not all zeros. Zero is that, <laughs> with the one right there. And so what you suggested was, is that if we have, we look at that first bit, if that first bit is a one, then this is either, this is non-negative, right? This is zero or more. If that first bit is a zero, it has to be a negative number. That's right. And because of that, this is sometimes referred to as the sign bit. You can tell what the sign is by looking at that particular bit. Now, do we ever actually look at bits in VBA? No. Could we look at bits in your computer with an electron microscope? Yeah, well, probably a normal microscope. Yes. Maybe an electron microscope. I'm not sure. But as soon as you do that, your memory is no good anymore. So don't, don't try that at home. Um, so here's, what's this? This is 33,768, which is actually how we store 1,000. Am I ever going to ask you to look at ones and zeros and say, what does this actually store if it's an integer? The answer is no. Um, but that's, that's what's going on under the hood. All the way full up is 65,000, but we can't go that high because it starts counting way negative. So the upper boundary is 32,767. So what is the range for integer type? Uh, oh, yeah, the range is how far it goes. What's the lower boundary and the upper boundary? It's negative 32,768 to positive 32,768. Am I expecting you to memorize that range? Let's vote. How many of you want to memorize that range? Yeah, you don't have to memorize that range. But I am going to have you memorize the first two numbers of the range, plus or minus 32,000. The integers, you got, because, <clears throat> folks, there's a midterm in this, midterm exam in this class. The midterm in this class is for, for really for one purpose. It is because you will be better at VBA if I compel you to memorize some stuff. And this is one of the things you'll be better at if you, if you have memorized. So you say, what size of variable should I use? You can think about the range and you go, oh, so is this going to be bigger or uh, bigger than 32,000? Like, no, this going to go up to two or 3,000, but it's never going to get above the 32,000. Then you know what, what data type should you use? Yeah, integer is the right one. You no reason to be using something that, that takes more memory, as long as it's an integer. I mean, if it's a decimal, it's a different story altogether. So here's a, so this is another data type. Data type is called integer. It takes two bytes of RAM, and you've got the range. So um, I'll expect you to know integer takes two bytes of RAM, and the, the range is roughly plus or minus 32,000. Um, don't feel like you've got to furiously take notes about this. This is in the textbook, and there's a study guide for the midterm where I tell you, make sure you pay attention to these things about variables. <laughs> Okay, so we've had two data types so far, byte and integer. There's another one that's very similar to it called long integer. It takes four bytes. And its range is roughly plus or minus two billion. Right, but it's only integers. So we get our three integer types, byte, integer, long. This is actually called a long integer but the data type name is just long. So we got byte, integer, and long are the names of the data types. Questions? Yes. Oh, it gets bigger. 
Are there, are there, are there larger integer types? The answer is no. Uh, the answer is yes. Sorry. Um, four bytes, if you have a 32-bit operating system, four bytes is as much memory as you can have. Sorry, four bytes. Four gigabytes is as much memory as you can have. And that's what you can, that's what you can, so with a long integer type, you have one number for every bit of your memory. 32-bit operating system. Anyone have a 32-bit operating system? You probably don't know, but the answer is not anymore. You all have 64-bit operating systems, um, which means if you had a 32-bit operating system, could you have more than four gigabytes of RAM in it? You could, but you couldn't, a you couldn't access it. Yeah, you, you'd have all this extra memory. It would do you absolutely no good because you can only access four gigabytes of RAM. 64 gigabyte or 64 bit operating system you can have a lot more how much way more than any computer uh, ever created has yeah maybe someday we'll get there but 64 64 gigabyte 64 bit operating system and so I if you have a 32 bit version of excel this is the biggest integer type there is but if you have a 64 bit version of excel which my guess is most of you probably have the 32-bit version of Excel because that's the default. If you just install it, that's how it default it installs. There's another data type called long, long. <laughs> it's not an ordinary long. It's a long, long. It really is. L-O-N-G, L-O-N-G. And it's, it's just it's bigger enough so that you can do all, all the one value for every bit of RAM that you have in the thing. You don't have to worry about long, long. It's, it's out of the scope of the class. Ah, so we've seen how to do integers, but we've got decimals. How do we do decimals? There are a couple of options about how to do decimals. Here's the first option. First option is to say, we're just going to store an integer, and we're going to know that the first four decimal places, or the first four digits, are past the decimal. Another way of saying that is store an integer and then divide it by 10,000 to come to the actual value that we're really interested in. So we say, here's store integer, count over four decimal places, and that's where the decimal place would go. This is what's referred to as a fixed point number, is that whatever we, we always store all numbers to four decimal, four digits of precision. And so you imagine here, here's a, a number that we have stored in here, 65,535. Um, that's if it's just the raw number. We're not thinking about negative numbers here. There's no fixed point number that's only two bytes, so this is just an example here. We divide it by 10,000. And so what number is really being stored here? That's, yeah, 6.5535. Because we, we, we store the integer version of it, the integer version of it, and then we say count over four decimal places, and that's, or count over four digits, that's where the decimal place goes. So here we've got, you know, another number, 52,000, divided by 10,000, that's 5.25. Uh, and this data type, that we're talking about is called currency. Each variable of currency takes eight bytes of memory, and it's roughly plus or, plus or minus, I'm not even sure we need the 220 here, it's roughly plus or minus nine billion. I'm sorry, 900 billion, sorry. 922 billion plus or minus is really what it is. And again, that's just, you know, what's, what's the range that we can do? Part of that's going to be the decimal point, and so you've got you have four, dis four decimals of precision every single time here. Questions? The data type is called currency. Yeah, so I could say I'm going to declare I need a variable. What type is it going to be? It's going to be currency, and I would actually type in the word currency. We'll see. We're going to see how to do this, but that's the data type that, that we would use. Big enough for the national debt? No, not even close. Right? What are we? Twenty trillion. By the way, uh, our national debt, to, to me, our national debt is the biggest threat to American security, is our national debt, in my estimation. Okay, there's another option. That's called a fixed point decimal. We just say everything gets stored to a certain number of, of we assume where the decimal point, go, decimal point goes, and then we record the digits so that that's where the decimal point we would give us the right, the right number. There's another one. The other portion, I the other option is to say, we're going to restore an integer still, but now we're going to allocate part of our memory to say, we'll store another number in this part of the memory that tells us where the decimal point goes. Here's an example. So I've got a couple of bytes here. I'm going to take four bytes just to tell us where the decimal point goes. 
So right now, there's no, I've got nothing in my decimal point portion, and I'm storing the number 3,574. Uh, and because there's no digits for the decimal, that's, th that's the number. So let's suppose we put one here in our part that says where the decimal point goes. So now we're saying, ah, but the decimal point goes one digit. One digit from the right is where the decimal point goes. Two digits from the right, three digits from the right. So we're using a portion of the memory to say, where's the decimal? And then the rest of the memory tells us what's the number that we're working with. Our currency is called a fixed point number. This is called a Floating, yeah, it's called a floating point number. So if you've heard that term floating point number, that's, that's where the term comes from. You oh, we always store integers, and then somehow we have to say, where does the decimal point go in that? And that's what a floating point number is. When, um, when I was probably about where you are now, you know, I, was, I was a college student, Intel made a chip. It was probably called the Pentium, the Pentium 4, was that the name of a chip? I don't know. They made a chip that had errors in its floating point calculations. Like you would do floating point math and it would get it wrong. Could you imagine your computer actually doing math wrong? Oh, it was frightening. Uh, I mean, it, it, was, it, it wasn't such a big deal because it was, it was way out in the end that it was doing it wrong, but it was getting it wrong. Yeah. Floating point has a limit. Yeah, it has a limit too. So let's just kind of look here. So we, 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 we're, we're saying, hey, we're going to give ourselves 15 Digits of, di digits of uh, precision here, and that's the number that we're talking about. Yeah, the range. Well, there's, there's no two-byte number. So again, we're showing two bytes here just so we can kind of see and talk about this. But there's, there is no two-byte two floating point number in VBA. Um, we're going to get there. Stand by. Here it is. So our smallest floating point number is called single. It stands for single precision floating point number. Uh, so the data type is called single. It's four bytes. And the range is, now this, it turns out, we'll see a disclaimer here in the presentation, but the actual implementation, the, the way VBA does floating point numbers is a little bit different than what I just described, but it's way more complex. Um, and so, I just want you to have that background and say, yeah, it's, eh, maybe it's a little bit different here, but this is the range. It's, it's plus or minus this huge number, but it's only significant to, s you only have seven significant digits. So you can make a really, really big number, but you know, you only get precision up here, or you can, you can put the decimal place anywhere you want. You can go really, really precise, but you really only have seven significant digits to work with. Double precision floating point number, twice as much memory. That is the range. But only, but only 15 um, significant digits. So you've got kind of this, you, you can express this number, and you've got something else that's saying, where is the decimal point? And it could be way off to one end or way off to the other end, but you've got that, you know, you've got the digits that you're recording, but then you can, you can actually make them you know, really far away from the decimal point in either direction. Uh, I don't know. It says it in the textbook, I think. What's that? <coughs> it's six or seven. Yeah. So why are we jumping? What, if, if our author thinks this belongs in chapter six, why are we jumping all the way in here? Uh, because otherwise, every other example we do, I, I, I just keep saying, okay, so we make a variable, and then I think, you know what a variable is. And so we're kind of pulling this forward. Okay, uh, only precise to 15 significant digits. Actual implementation may vary here in VBA, which it does. All right, how do we do dates? So here, again, we got, we got to get down to ones and zeros. And so here we store the number of days from some index date. So remember, with all these data types, what happens is, is that we give the interpreter a number, it then stores it, and it remembers the assumptions it makes. It stores some number, but it goes, oh, it's an integer. So when I give this back, I've got to take the number I stored. I've got to add it to negative 32,767 to give back the value. So here we say store a date. And what's it going to do? It's going to store a certain number of days before or after December 30th, 1899, which seems like such a strange day to be the first day, but that's it. That's day zero. And so if the, if the day I store is one, it would be December 31st, 1899. If it's two, it would be January 1st, 
1900. And so this number, 27,945, anyone want to guess what that is? Rough guess of what 27,000 days is? No, not today. Knowing a little bit about my other interest in life besides VBA? July 4th, 1776. So that then is you know, how you would store that particular date. It's some number of days from the index date. Again, a VBA interpreter will store the number, but I ask for the date back, and it does the calculation that it remembered, and it gives us back the date. But how about a date and a time? It's not just the number of days. It's, it's not the integer number of days. It's the fractional number of days. So here, we've got that same part here that's saying 27,000 days from the index date gets us to, to January or July 4th, 76, but the 0.37 gets us to 9 a.m. And so, in fact, dates are stored. They look just exactly like long integer, uh, um, uh, double precision floating point numbers. So you've got this double precision number. It stores that, and then you've got that same kind of precision. So you are, you know, limited to this, this range. Um, January 1st in the year 100 to December 31st, the year 9999. That's like an arbitrary cutoff. They could have done, they probably could have got a, a larger range, but so, you know, let's have some clear starting and ending date. That's what they did. Oh, last one. How do we do names? Now, this is a little tougher because we've got, how do you represent an A? You know, so far we've figured out decimals and we've figured out, um, you know, integers and even dates, but dates are all numeric. How are we going to do a name? And this is a little interesting. So what we do is we say, listen, each character is going to uh, is going to be a value between we're just going to say each character gets some value between 0 and 255. Now, what range? What is it? What can we do integers from 0 to 255? How many bytes does that take? Thinking back to our very first example, at one byte, the, the range the range for the byte data type is 0 to 255. So, to store a character and I can, you know, store a character with one byte you know, right here is 255. What if I want to do characters that aren't in those 255? There's a thing called Unicode, which lets us say, oh, we can have multiple bytes per character. That's beyond what we're doing here. We're just kind of getting started here. So we're saying we've only got 255 character, 256 characters to work with, and so we've got one byte per character. And so here is uh, stored 65, and we just say we know that 65 maps to capital A. Uh, and there might be others. Um, here's John Adams. I'm just we just took that same byte and we tipped it on its side so that we could spell out John Adams here. So A is 65, D is 100, lowercase d is 100. If we look at our comma over here, the comma has its own code as well. That's number 44. Uh, space is 32, uh, capital J is 74, and so forth. And so... So, so string is different. So this is actually this, this is a data type called string, which I think we'll see here. Oh, did we actually talk about it? I don't think I actually showed the name here. Maybe it's coming up. Uh, this data type is called string, and it's different than all the ones before it. All the ones before it are fixed, uh, fixed length variables, which means when you declare the variable, it allocates that memory. The variable stays right there because you're always going to use that amount of memory for it. Um, you, if you, if you want to go bigger than that, it's not going to happen in that variable. String is what's called a variable length data type because it takes, depending on what we store, it's going to allocate more memory for it because it needs one byte per character. So if I store a really small string, it's just going to be a few bytes. If I store a really long string, it's going to be longer because it's one byte per character. This then is the table. It's the, called the ASCII table, the American Standard Code for Information, Information Interchange. And here's what it is. So here's capital A, 65. Uh, where's the comma? We saw it was 44. There's the comma. Where's the space? Here's space. It's 32. Uh, what was 100? Here's 100, the lowercase d. And so it just knows. We store that number, and then it will convert it. We say, give it the name John Adams, and it says A65, uh, D100. And it goes through, and it stores all that out. And we say, give us that back, and it reads those numbers back, and it goes, here's the first one. It's 65A, and it gives us back the A. So we give it the characters, it gives us back the characters, it converts everything to numbers on the way, and those numbers then ultimately get written down into bits in the same way that any number gets written into, into bits. These first 32 characters over here are unusual. They're non-printable characters. Everything over here is printable. Even though space doesn't look like much, you can print it. At least you can print it. 
Um, have you seen like an old, a movie that showed that depicts an old time newsroom? Oh, there was one that was pretty popular just recently. Had a, um, I want to say Gwyneth Paltrow or The Post. Yeah, I'd, I've never seen it. Who, who, who's the main character there? Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, and so I haven't seen it, but I'm sure that there must be some scene in there where they're in a newsroom, and in the back you can hear this chatter going away that just sounds like people typing like crazy on electric typewriters. Is, that, is there a scene like that in the movie? Or have you seen a movie that has an old-school newsroom, and you hear that sound in the back? Um, are, are those just people typing like crazy? The answer is no. So what those are, those newsrooms were, is that they had what's referred to as a teletype machine. It's like a printer and a telephone fell in love and had a child. And, and it's like where you say, listen, I've got a printer on one end of this and another device that transmits on the other end of the telephone line, and it sends these numbers across, and we would send across 65, and that printer on the other end of the teletype machine would go, ah, 65, that's an A, and it would, boom, it would strike the paper and make the A print on the paper. We used to, like, get all of our news coming in by, by being printed in, into this, you know, onto paper, and then from there they would do whatever they do with newspapers to make it, you know, print. And so, you know, we print all the letters in here, but you need something besides letters to be able to make the message come through. And here's one of them right here. Number 13 is the carriage return. So you can imagine that thing typing across. Pop, 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 Oh, ding is seven. Audible bell. Ding. You send a seven and it goes ding. And then you send a 13 and it goes zip. And then you send a 10 and it goes click. Right? What's 10? 10 is the line feed. Yeah, and so you've got all these other characters here that we, we don't use very much anymore. Well, some of them we do, like the, the carriage return and line feed. That's still how we mark the end of a line. We put those characters like into a file, and that goes, oh, did you ever wonder? And if you have like a text file, it's all one long stream of characters. How does it know to break right here? Well, if you have an editor that just goes, that's as far as we can fit, we'll wrap it down. But if you put a carriage return in there, what's carriage return? Number 13. You put a carriage return in there, it goes, oh, there's a carriage return character. I don't print that. What do I do? Move down and start again. And in fact, in Windows operating system, it's actually a two-character two sequence to say end of the line. It's just what you would do on a typewriter. It's a carriage return and a, and a line feed. So it's actually, you know, for no good reason, it takes two characters to say end of line in, uh, in a Windows file. That's just the convention that they use. And so, uh, so even though the history for these you know, comes from a long way back, they're still part of the standard. Uh, Audible Bell is great. Backspace is great. You know, you want to make something go funky, put a, put a character number eight into a text file and see what happens. It's going along and all of a sudden it backspace is over. But yeah. Different editors handle that differently. When they, they won't ever put a backspace in because when you hit backspace, what does it do? It deletes something. You know, but you could edit that file. You could you know, open it up with what's called a hex editor. And you can go, <laughs> change that character to character number eight and just see what happens. Okay. So that may be the end. Uh, no, there's 65... Oh, one other thing here, and that is because the string is because the string is a variable length data type. There's a little bit of overhead involved, and when I built this, <laughs> when I built this slide, I've used it for a couple of years, and I realized just in the last class, the overhead's in the wrong place. The overhead should be at the top, because this character 65. Wait, maybe is that right? Actually, all I need is one block of four, four bytes for this whole string, John Adams. So this is a really bad slide, but let me just explain it to you. So when I allocate a string, I say, give me, give me a string variable. It says, oh, you're going to need some memory, and we're going to allocate four bytes immediately. And then it's going to say, all right, you know, we're going to actually store something in there, because this, this string variable, we've got to find some place in memory where all of these characters can go right next to each other. I, I can't have this go part way, bump into something else in memory and go, hey, that's allocated for somebody else. Oh, well, my string will pick up down here and continue on. No, no, no. It's got to start at an address and be contiguous bits of, of RAM to be able to, to, get my, to get my string. And so let's just imagine that we say, okay, we know it starts here because that's what the, the variable name is. It's, it, it's a reference to a, a location in memory. It's a starting point in memory. And so, great, we just start reading the next eight bytes, there's a character. Next eight bytes, there's a character. Next eight bytes, there's a character. How does it know when to stop? Is there some way to put something else besides a one and a zero that says, oh, here's a Q, that means stop? Ones and zeros is all we have. So how could it possibly know when to stop? And the answer is, we start off with four bytes that says, how long is the string? How long is the string? And so those four bytes 
then say, oh, this string could be anywhere between one character and whatever you can do with four bytes. It's a lot. Four billion. And not four bits. Four, four bytes. So, so four times eight bits, and that's about four billion. So how long could a string be? Four gigabytes. You can have a string that's four gigabytes long. The string variable. It's a lot of data. Um, but you've got that overhead that says we've got the first little bit that we have to allocate to say how long it is. Question? Yeah? How does a zip file compress stuff? You want to know the answer to that? I'd be glad to tell you that that means that we won't be able to actually see the example of how to make a variable. What do you want to see? Do you want to know how a zip file works or do you want to see how to make a variable in VBA? You're going to see the variable. You'll see the variable anyway. If we don't talk about a zip file, it's our last moment to talk about it. You want to hear about it? Let's go ahead and talk about zip file. <coughs> so um, let's do this. Let's take a look at some, something that might compress pretty well. Let me go to a website. Oh, actually, I shouldn't have closed that. That would have, that would have compressed well. Too late now. Can I, oh, here we go. I'm okay, so let me just, let me just look at this. Control U. This is the source of this page. And zoom in. Control plus. Plus, 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 plus. Okay. Look at this and tell me, do you see any repeating patterns here? We see some tags, so we can see TR is probably going to happen a lot. Uh, slash TH happens a lot. Uh, BR happens a lot. And so I've got um, maybe, you know, depending on this, maybe I've got you know, some blocks like this. I've got the color, um, this color. So, you know, some of these are shown. Maybe, so imagine that I've got you know, some description. This one's not all that. It's not going to compress all that well. But I've got you know, things that there's lots of duplication in the page. So the way a zip file works, well, zip file does two things. Um, first of all, it works with more than one file. So you can take multiple files and you can cram them all together into one file. And that's kind of what, th what the beginning of an archive was. Take a whole bunch of files, put them in one file so that I can move it around easier and then take it apart. But then they said, wow, we've got a lot of redundancy in this. And so what a zip file does is it says, well, let's just kind of look through here and find all the redundancy. And so maybe the term web query shows up in here multiple times. Can you see web query somewhere else? Web query right here. Character for character, exactly the same. Uh, anywhere else? Web query, character for character, exactly the same. What, is it, what, the, what the compression algorithm does is it says, oh, we just found this string of characters, space, web query, space, um, space, web, space, query, space, boom. That happens in like 12 places here. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a table, and we're going to say, take those 12 things, put that into my table, and then use a symbol that doesn't take as many characters and say that refers to web query. So we take all those little parts and we say web query is word number one. We're going to put that as a one, 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 one. We'll find other things that repeat a lot here. Maybe quote repeats multiple times here. That'll be a two. We'll put the two there, two, 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 two. And so when we come back to, to, to unencrypt it, we say go through here. Oh, there's the one. Put in web query. Find every place there's a one. Change it with a web query. Bop, 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 bop. Find it where there's a quote or a two and change it with quote. Bop, 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 bop. So that's what it does. It says it, it only works because there's redundancy. And so if you look at something like an image, an image file, and so if you think about how much redundancy is there in an image file, not very much. And so that's why image files don't compress very well because there's, there's, there's not redundancy in it that it can say, take these out, build a table, and, and put something smaller in there that you can make it smaller. That's how a zip file works. Did you feel like you understood that explanation? The rest? Ah, oh, wonderful. All right, well, that's it for today, and uh, we'll see how to actually make a variable next time we get together, I'm sure. Class dismissed.